Um, if you want, you can turn on your screens. You don't need to. Uh, I can see some of you. Uh, so I'm Brian Schiffman, our president and CEO at the Vaughn Chamber of Commerce. I uh, see a lot of uh, familiar faces and some new people. So uh, today's session, uh, as, as we've done with all of them, we are recording it, so it'll be viewed afterwards as well. Um, we called it uh, PPE, where to source it and keeping your workplace safe. Uh, throughout the COVID from the very beginning in March, uh, where there were a lot of questions about cash flow concerns and uh, what do I do with my employees, a lot of concerns about the rental assistance program and reopening guidelines and now the mask guidelines specifically uh, that came in a little while ago and, and the phase we're in now. But, but the thing that's throughout all of it has been about how do I keep myself, my employees, my customers safe. Uh, and, and PPE has been really behind everything. So it's really a huge issue that keeps coming up. So we felt that it was time to do a specific PPE session. <clears throat> and we brought on four great people who we know and trust to talk about uh, not so much their products as much as how they position themselves during COVID and tried to help the community uh, with securing PPE type supplies or redesigning their office. So uh, what I'm going to do is first, I want to thank the city of Vaughan. Uh, they've supported us in all of our sessions. So it's economic and cultural development. So we appreciate that. And I want to uh, highlight Harkel Furniture and uh, we have their president, uh, Howard Clear from our board. Uh, he's going to be speaking soon, but I just wanted to thank Harkel for sponsoring today's session and pass it over to you, Howard, just for a moment, if you wanted sure. to make any opening remarks. Sure. Thanks, Brian. Uh, it, it was, uh, it's a privilege to sponsor um, uh, this uh, Vaughn Chamber event. Um, you know, I've been following all along since mid-March when this, this whole pandemic uh, uh, landed in our backyard. Um, and Brian and the staff have done such an amazing job to keep the uh, chamber members informed uh, during this crazy pandemic. And uh, it was a very easy decision to sponsor it. And uh, this is one of the areas that, uh, uh, that we're in. Um, to help keep offices safe and, uh, and running. So thank you, Brian. Thanks again, Howard. So uh, I'm going to go to, um, we have Abina uh, is in the session and Abina is going to share her screen. Has, Abina, is that your screen? No. So I don't know who's, who that is. Can we, uh, can we take that off? So it's Daniel Foley. Um, for some reason, he's put up his screen. I'm not sure why. Um, I can see him shaking his head, so there, no problem. Okay, there we go. Okay, can everybody see the uh, back to business source and local personal uh, protective equipment? Can I get a couple? Ha not perfect, Anthony says yes. Okay, so Abina's behind, this, uh, behind the scenes here and we just wanted to show our, our PPE guide that we did in conjunction with the other eight chambers in York Region. Uh, this is uh, the, the various providers that we're aware of in York Region that have any number of supplies, whether it's masks or they can redesign your office or it's face shields or uh, it's sanitation, infection control. So, Bina, if you can go down to the Vaughan section, there are sections for every area of York Region. And in Vaughan, you see a lot of companies listed. So, all the companies we have on today, the four speakers are here. Uh, but we also have a lot of great companies like Amendola Group and Sterling Industries. Uh, so that's my way of saying that there are a lot of companies uh, that, that we're aware of in the Vaughn community offering these products. Uh, and we recommend that uh, for companies that are looking for supplies, uh, source local, uh, talk to these companies first. So uh, I'm going to, I mean, that's perfect. Thanks so much. And if others want that, you just go to the home page and it's under news. So you can, you can see that anytime on the vonchamber.ca homepage. Okay, so at this point, uh, we're gonna, I'm just gonna introduce the speakers and uh, just go over some formats. So what we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna have each speaker uh, go for about 15 minutes or so. Um, if you have comments, if I could just ask you to keep it muted while they're speaking, if you have any comments, please put it in the chat box. Uh, that would help us and, and we'll direct questions to you and we're going to see how it goes. We may stop between the speakers. We might save all questions to the end. It'll depend how much feedback you're giving us in the chat box. So we'll be monitoring. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce all four speakers and then we're going to go back to Anthony. He's going to kick us off. 
So we have Anthony Gennaro. He's the CEO of A to Z Mobility uh, Home Healthcare. And uh, I'm going to let Anthony talk about his company shortly, but uh, I want to thank him for being here. Also a board member with the Vaughn Chamber. We, we introduced Howard Clear. He's the president of Harkel Office Furniture. Uh, and uh, Howard's been redesigning a lot of spaces. So I'm going to let him talk about that. Thank you again for sponsoring today. We have Peter Sandica, the president of Sterol. Uh, infection control, and also his colleague, Natalie Weber, the VP of Business Development. Hey guys, thanks for joining us. And Peter's also a board member, so we can say we trust these people. And we have Perminder Sandu, the CEO of Santa Health, uh, Santa Technologies. And uh, Perminder's got a really interesting product. It's a special program with the Vaughn Chamber uh, on contact tra tracing and health screening. So look forward to seeing yours as well. So um, at this point, just remember if you could keep your uh, your screen's muted, and if you have questions, put them in the chat box. And Anthony, let's go over to you, and uh, thanks for being here. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, my name is Anthony Gennaro, and I am the CEO of A to Z Mobility, um, which is a small business in Vaughan, which actually means that I am the order taker, the check signer, toilet bowl washer of A to Z Mobility. Um, I, what I'm going to give you is a little synopsis of what my little sector of all this PPE has, uh, has meant to us. Uh, people think because we had access to PPE for the last six or seven months that we've been making hand over fist, uh, in cash and, and, and revenues have skyrocketed, which is a little false. Um, and, and I'll give you the reasons why. Uh, we offer a wide range of products uh, for purchase and rental, such as wheelchairs, home health care beds, bathroom safety, rollator stair lifts, um, dressing tools and condensed products. And over the last six months, we've had to increase our PPE selection. Uh, we have always done PPE. We deal with a large number of hospital discharges, chemo patients, geriatrics. Um, so gloves, masks, gowns, sanitizers, wipes have always been part of our repertoire. Uh, in March, when PPE became popular, uh, as many of you know, it also became very scarce. The general public started hoarding and global manufacturing could not keep up. Uh, those of us who use reputable suppliers in the industry, in the home healthcare industry, were fortunate enough to have a supply but we all went on fair share allocation. So for example, um, we were selling a few thousand vinyl and nitrile gloves a week prior to COVID. And demand went up in some cases as much as a thousand percent. And my stock orders weekly went from 6,000 units to maybe 6,000 units a month. So as supply grew dramatically, um, or as the demand grew dramatically, the supply dropped dramatically. Hospital, long-term care, medical offices, frontliners all became priority and had no choice but to share with the limited quantities there were. And because A to Z's focus is discharges from hospitals, motor vehicle accidents, and insurance, there was a steep decline in the sector. Uh, people stayed home. So they stopped driving. So motor vehicle accidents stopped dramatically. Uh, no elective surgery. So for example, knee and hip replacements and other surgeries that would require rental uh, equipment upon discharge kind of disappeared. Occupational therapists stopped visiting homes. Doctor's offices were closed. So scripts for canes and braces and all that pretty much dro dropped. Um, and we were very fortunate that we are very fortunate at that we had no layoffs um, over this whole period. Uh, numbers from 2019 to 2020 are a little off, but without COVID there, I would just say that's part of business. We struggled as an industry uh, with three biggest hurdles during the pandemic. Um, an increase of sanitization and safety protocol for employees and rental equipment, which everybody had to go through. The optics of price gouging and counterfeit products and pop-up fly-by-night retailers. 
So the increase of sanitization and safety protocol for employees and rental equipment, um, we got bombarded by healthcare facilities, private clients and others wanting to know how we were and still are gonna protect them when delivering product. So our sanitization process when rental comes back was already above industry standards before all this happened. I tried to make sure that my staff and my family were always safe. So when staff enters a home now, gloves, masks, sanitizer, social distancing are all required. And my staff is not shy to tell a client, you're too close to me right now. Um, we, we have set that in. So there is social distancing still in a tight apartment or a home. My worst nightmare before all this was bringing home bed bugs or the common flu. And now it's COVID. So our sanitization process basically tripled. We not only sanitize an item when it's returned from a client, all items then have a 72 hour rest period, which means it does not go back into the community for at least 72 hours. All items are sanitized before it gets into our van and it gets sanitized at the client's home again, one more time. Uh, some items throughout the industry, we all chose, um, all retailers chose not to rent out anymore. So for example, commodes or uh, bath chairs. These are items that some people only needed for a month or two, but even though we were very confident that we can get everything that was attached to it off, we didn't want the hesitation or the blame that it was from us. So we all um, decreased the size of our rental programs. So what does all this mean to the general retailer um, in uh, the home healthcare sector is that it translates into cost. Unlike some other businesses, uh, we had an existing line in our annual budget for sanitization and PPE products. Um, now, like all businesses, post-COVID, that line on the budget has increased somewhat dramatically. We had to take this very seriously because healthcare facilities and the general public would threaten and have threatened not to use us because these protocols have to be in place, but not only in place, but they have to be enforced. The optics of gouging really hit our sector. Um, we had a hard time with this because during the pandemic, our margins actually in decreased. Uh, we have clients that have been dealing with us for years that buy PPE regularly. And when they reorder a box of surgical masks, for example, in January, a box of surgical masks for 50 pieces cost $10 and 95 cents. Mid March, late April, that box, not from us, but from some other retailers or people off the street, went up to $100 a unit. So it went from 20 cents to $2 a unit, which is an incredible, um, an incredible increase. And also things like hand sanitizer. Uh, hand sanitizer went from $2 for 100 mil up to 6.95 for 100 mil. So when all this was happening, we took a different approach than a lot of other retailers or pop-up PPE suppliers. We decided we were not gonna sell items for what the market was dictating. We were gonna sell PPE at a fair markup at what we thought clients could pay without worrying about them choosing their personal safety over limited funds. You know, people in our business need to remember, or people, uh, and businesses need to remember also that the price increase also came from suppliers in April, uh, which retailers had no choice but to increase prices. But retailers also have a social responsibility to keep them at fair prices. Uh, the second issue we talked about, or, or I mentioned, was counterfeit products and pop-up fly-by-nights, I, I, what I call them fly-by-nights. Um, this bothered me tremendously because the number of people who had twenty or thirty thousand dollars sitting in the bank or under their mattress uh, went to China, Asia, and bought garbage products at ridiculous rates. Brought it back here, flooded the market. Uh, some of the overpriced and uncertified. 
And that is even if they got the product delivered, because I, I've heard of some horror stories of so-called manufacturers in Asia asking for prepayment on the on these items and never delivering. Then if they were lucky to get the product here, they came with fake FDA certs or material was substandard. So in this case of saying, you know, you get what you pay for is not true because a good number of PPE at a high price was not what they say it was. And I applaud the general public uh, for becoming informed and educated for the most part on what they were and where they were buying. 25 years ago, shoes and TVs that fell off the back of trucks was a high commodity. But who would have thought that in 2020, that shifted to PPE? You know, um, the, sorry, and the optics of gouging, yeah, I'm sorry, and counterfeit. So um, this is just our general story. This is the general story of a lot of retailers that are in this sector uh, for the last six months. But I need you to understand that is not only our story. Again, it is the story of a lot of us. Um, retailers, uh, long-term care facilities, hospitals. So moving forward, A to Z has uh, decided to purchase and deliver as many Canadian-made products that we can. Uh, we've been able to secure government-certified and funded surgical masks, sanitizers, shields, wipes, and a good percentage uh, made actually right here in Vaughan. Um, some items we still have no choice to purchase, uh, across Canada, uh, people will have no choice because places in Asia are set up to mass produce uh, gloves. Um, but hopefully in the next 12 to 24 months, operations will begin production in Canada. You know, when you consider buying for personal use or for your business, make sure there's a paper trail of certifications, NPN numbers, BIN numbers, uh, look for manufacturing dates and expiry dates. Look for UPC codes. Look for what items contain. Uh, between hand sanitizers, wipes, and masks, uh, Canadian government legislation is that those ingredients have to be listed. Understand that when working with a vendor, you need to create a realistic procurement list. You know, uh, don't hoard but set up a proper buying schedule. We are all still on fair share allocation. Uh, please buy from businesses that have a track record and can prove and verify what they're selling. There are other places to purchase PPE rather than office cleaning suppliers or big box stores. And often retailers such as myself or home healthcare stores, um, have more certified products because it's our livelihood. We need to make sure that the products that we are offering are proper. By local, by Canadian, uh, it can only help our community. Make sure that the products that you're buying, um, I'm sorry, you can check up on the recall list. Now the Canadian government has come up with a recall list for sanitizers for actually all PPE. Um, but when you're looking at that list, it's kind of uh, misleading at times because we went through it a few weeks ago and 90, no, I'm sorry, not 90, 60% uh, of the products on that recall, recall list are safe products, but they had mislabeled something. So they are good for the general public and businesses to use, but unfortunately they missed an ingredient or they didn't have French English writing on it and something like that automatically put them on the uh, recall list. So at the end of the day here, what I'm basically saying is that um, we, we had to switch gears. We had to sidestep, you know, uh, we get people calling day in and day out. We want this and we want that, but prices uh, are dictated not only, by us, but they're passed down from uh, the manufacturers and passed down from wholesalers. So that's basically what has happened in our sector over the last six months. 
Um, we are here to help and support. I am very fortunate and blessed that, again, we had no layoffs. Uh, we were able to do that little shift and we are here to help as many people as we possibly can. Um, I don't know if there's any questions at this point, but I'm, I think I took 13 minutes there and I'm sorry if I rambled on. No, you were uh, great, you are great. Um, uh, Maria, I saw your question. I'm going to leave that one for the end, uh, just because I think it's a more general question for everybody. Uh, I'm just going to, Anthony, I'm going to ask you one question now, and sure. maybe we'll have more for you later, just about how you've handled uh, uh, actual shipping of your products. Is it curbside pickup, or are you personally mm -hmm. delivering it? So, so we're doing a little bit of everything right now. We um, Obviously, everybody knows who's in some sort of industry right now, UPS, Canpar, uh, even Canada Post, their delays in delivering product has, is extraordinary right now. They don't guarantee next day anymore. And what they consider next day can be three to four days. So if you're local to the G GTA and local to the GTA, what we decided was that if you spent X amount of dollars with us, we will deliver it. And when we deliver it, we sanitize it. We put it into bags before it leaves our facility. Porch drop off. Um, the amount of curbside pickup is, is incredible. And that was a whole thing we had to deal with too, is learn how to do a curbside pickup. Cause some people wouldn't even roll down their window. They would talk to us through the window and like, okay. And, and, you know, obviously in retail, you don't know who all your clients are. So Joe would show up at my office, uh, back up to my front door and I'd walk over and I'd say, you know, uh, who are you with the ro window rolled up? All you would see his lips move and say, all right. Okay, and then the trunk would open. You put it in the trunk and, and you close the trunk for them. And, and then as, the, as you're walking away, they roll down the window and say, did you wash your hands before you came out? So <laughs> you, you, even people um, were, were a little bit worrisome about that. Now that has declined actually considerably in the last month or so. Uh, so shipping things, uh, UPS and commercially like that did drop for us, but we, we made it that we weren't going to let you suffer um, because of cost or timing. We, we decided we were going to deliver right away. Okay, that's great. So that was Anthony from A to Z Mobility. Thanks a lot, Anthony. So we'll have more questions at the end. Uh, now we're going to turn to Howard Clearer who we introduced earlier, and uh, Howard's gonna talk about uh, how to position your office space in terms of design. Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, so just to, uh, before I pull up the screen and share it with you guys, um, we've, uh, since, since March, we've, we've still been open. We're deemed essential because we look after a lot of healthcare facilities, hospitals. Um, so we've had a lot of experience dealing with uh, clients and their number one question was, how do we prepare our office and how do we make our staff feel safe? Um, so uh, part of the exercise was in fact doing our offices and making sure that our staff uh, are safe. And you know we have close to 50 people that have been here as, as the same as Anthony, we haven't laid anybody off. We've had that luxury. Um, in fact, we, um, uh, the, one of the first things we did was we hired uh, Natalie and Peter's company to uh, sterilize our place, as well as the product we had in our warehouse to make sure that whatever we were shipping, uh, you know, was uh, COVID free or, 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 or uh, a healthy, uh, a healthy product. So I'm just going to share the screen and hopefully I get this right because I'm not the most technical, but let's see what happens. All right. Nicely done. Thanks. Okay. So we've all heard about the two meters apart and the um, you know, keeping social distance. So how do we prepare and do that for the office place? So um, I'm not going to go into the hard cow part. If people don't know us, we've been around for 40 years. Uh, we moved up to Vaughan uh, 16 years ago. And first thing we did was join the Vaughan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but we can go over that later on. Anyway, 
six foot separation between workstations. So this is an actual client's uh, office space. So the first thing we do is we take their existing facility and we start to look at uh, a few different things. One is how are the staff working? What are the heights of the panels? Um, what is the traffic flow like? Um, you know, we're t we'll touch on a thing called wayfinding, which is the, the way you um, walk through the office and how do we reduce uh, traffic. Um, and you can see in this particular client, the circles don't touch each other. So we're able to maintain a six foot distance. Now, you know, all of this is questionable because uh, as they sit inside your cubicle with tall panels, do you really need to be six foot apart? A perfect example is um, uh, if anybody's golfed lately, you can sit in a golf cart with a stranger as long as you have a thin piece of plastic between you. So six foot distancing behind workstations is a question that um, I would love to be able to ask our government, but right now uh, they're, not, they're, not giving us, they're not giving us enough information other than what you're seeing on your screen. So just to give you an idea, the trend in the office place was low workstations, lots of uh, collaboration, being able to talk and touch and, and feel and compare notes. And we reduced the um, square footage per person from five years ago, six years ago, from 200 square feet down to 150 square foot per person, which means the density in the offices is greater, which means there's a bigger um, demand on the HVAC system because now you've got 30 to 40 percent more people in the same space. So how do we manage that? You're hearing about uh, the government asking buildings to upgrade HVAC. Um, your heating and air conditioning and making sure that they're changing the, the filters regularly or using better filters. So from our point of view, which is the office furniture, we're now changing stations, same stations, we're adding Plexi, uh, we're trying to provide a better work environment. In this particular case, this client went from this to that. Is there an investment? A hundred percent. But you can bring your staff back. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on. Um, you know, you're hearing about all these offices that, you know, people are staying home, staying home to the new year. Uh, the mayor touched on it at our AGM when he said, you know, he's shutting down the city hall till, till um, uh, January. But there are some companies, including myself, my company, that can't function with people working at home. We have departments that must collaborate. So we need to get our people back and we need to make sure they're safe. This uh, layout is a current layout from a small company called Google. This is how they operate. Um, this is uh, Google's office in Toronto under the Regis umbrella. And it's total flexibility inside this pit. Those desks can turn, rotate, move. Um, Again, all about collaboration, all about sharing ideas, uh, growing the business through sharing ideas. Today, it's gonna to look like something like that. And same product, we've augmented it. Obviously, they're on a different budget than most of the companies we're dealing with in Vaughan, but it gives an opportunity to change your workspace to, to something new. So, um, again, uh, we can help transform the office. Um, you, you know, you have to be cognizant of it and, and aware, and you've got to make sure the staff feel safe. Social distance guards, you see this at every bank, you see it everywhere that there's uh, interaction between uh, people and staff. Uh, again, we're providing those for hotels, um, retail shops, donut shops, offices, reception. Wayfinding. This is probably the biggest challenge in an office place, is how do we move people through the building? One of the reasons we're hearing that 
the big banks and the insurance companies in downtown Toronto aren't coming back so soon is because they can only fit three to three to four, maybe two to three people in an elevator. And when you have 2,500 people in your, uh, in your building at Bay and Wellington, by the time you get them all up, it's lunchtime. So you might as well stay home and do work. And hopefully, hopefully um, this can change soon with people wearing masks and, and so on. But wayfinding has become very, very big um, uh, for us. And that includes which doors to enter and staircases. You know, we don't want traffic. We, we want to be able to social distance. In order to social distance, we have to be able to manage that. And that includes community centers um, for uh, um, the city of Brampton. Uh, we're, we're managing every one of their uh, community centers. And it's, it's the same way. How do we get people through the building? And how do we make sure they're safe? Um, the next slide, lunchrooms. Yes, we do a lot of schools. It's, a, it's quite the, uh, the look to have your kids sitting at a lunchroom table, but this is what it might come down to. Uh, we've had a few applications in, in uh, universities where they've already asked us for this uh, for their lunchrooms or cafes. It looks very solitary and it looks very cold and doesn't look like a very good place to socially gather. But when you have hundreds of students or hundreds of employees, how do you manage that? In our particular office, we've closed our lunchroom and only to warm up your food for lunch and to grab a coffee. But there's no socializing, two people at a time. Uh, and then you eat at your desk. Interesting looking courthouse. So, Again, social distancing, how do we bring people back into the courthouse? Um, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, of um, uh, cases that are done virtually now. And in speaking to some of my lawyer friends, it's very, very difficult to do a Zoom trial. Um, again, I'm not an expert in law by far, but they were telling me that, you know, body language, um, you know, are they being coached by a person beside them in a Zoom call? All these things. So, so we're getting requests for um, the courthouses and places of worship to come up with uh, a, a solution uh, like you see in these, uh, in these screens. Lecture halls for universities. Yeah, maybe we went a little far off from offices, but companies that have training rooms or meeting rooms, we're also starting to adapt into, again, social distancing. I don't want to be the guy in the, I don't want to be the guy sitting in the first row with the guy in the second row coughing behind me. I mean, you see that you, you, you see that all the time at the movie theaters. Um, they're adapting a different way. Sanitization stations. Our requests for these have been huge. Um, one of the school boards uh, recently placed an order uh, for this. This is a, done with a foot pump. So we, 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 it allows students not to have to touch any of the pumps or any of the, so again, reducing the, the um, uh, chance of transmission. So these are the things that um, we've been working on and um, we've had some great success. We've been able to help companies get back to work. Um, besides having all these tools and all these devices, it's important that you create a COVID policy in your office. So as I mentioned in ours, the lunchroom uh, is closed. Boardrooms, you know, our eight-person boardroom is now a four-person boardroom. Our four-person boardroom is basically a two-person boardroom. And we're utilizing technology in Zoom and other, other uh, formats for that. Um, we talked about wayfinding. One of the biggest challenges we had uh, was getting the staff to follow and understand what we're trying to, trying to achieve. So mid-March, when this broke out, yes, we were open. 
What we did is we reduced our staff to about 12 and we set up people to, to work from home. And then we sanitized our place. We put in the proper equipment so that they could work at their workstations. And then uh, we slowly onboarded staff. So we did by departments. That way we could get people used to working in the new environment. And uh, it's been a success. Like I said, we've been fortunate. We haven't had any issues. We have some people that take the TTC to work. We haven't had any issues. And uh, like Anthony said, we're, we're blessed. We're still in business. We're still um, uh, doing the best we can and uh, we're still healthy. So thank you. And if there's any questions, please reach out to myself or any of the staff here and we'd be happy to help you. Thanks, that's, that was great, Howard. Uh, both you and Anthony certainly have the right attitude. And uh, I mean, I thought your points about wayfinding hadn't really considered that so much for places of worship and schools, but that makes a lot of sense. Um, just wondering about shipping delays. Like what's the timeline to get those products? Sure. Is, is that slowed down based on manufacturing timelines? No? So we use uh, only local Canadian suppliers and some of them are even in, in Vaughan. Um, and that was, that was the biggest question we started getting into this because as we got closer to stage three, more companies were saying, okay, now I need it. We started the planning uh, with these companies in end of March. So what we did from, um, we went through our client list for customers that have bought in the last two years, uh, especially the low panel collaboration type stations, because we thought they'd be the first companies um, to make the retrofit. So we started with them and, and we were actually proactive in that saying, look, we're not selling anything at the moment, but here's your options if and when you get your staff back to work. Um, we spent a lot of time with the realtors and the designers and architects in the city to understand wayfair, wayfinding and being able to come up with a, a solution for that. We went to a third party uh, printing company uh, that specializes in labels and and they were the ones that created the those labels and stickers for the floors um, for us so we, we spent a lot of time developing this and working with the right people um, you know as I mentioned uh, earlier on we're deemed essential because we look after health care so it was easy to tap into some of the infection control people at the hospitals to say what's good and what's bad like, where do we need to be? What height panels do we need to be? Um, we didn't get concrete answers, but uh, it gave us enough information to create a, 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 a proper and healthy workspace. And ours is a perfect example. I have, of the 50 staff, I have 46 back full time. The other four staff have little kids and we'll see what happens when school starts. All right, thanks a lot, Howard. So that was Howard from uh, Harkel Office Furniture. Uh, I wanted to recognize uh, Joe Pampina from C4C Coaching for Change is another board member we have on today. So thanks for being here. Joe, I saw your question as well. So that one's pretty broad. So I wanna leave that to the end uh, for everybody. And uh, let's go to Peter Sandica uh, from Sterol, uh, president there, uh, Sterol Infection Control. It's a good segue from Howard and also uh, Natalie Weber, also from Sterol. Good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Sundiga, and I'm the president and CEO of uh, Steroid Infection Control, uh, a division of uh, Renolux uh, Restore Group. So uh, we have been helping the community uh, for the past six months to uh, uh, stay uh, safe and, and clean at uh, 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 their places of work and, and homes. Uh, and uh, our company uses uh, state-of-the-art uh, technology, new technology to perform those uh, disinfection and sterilization system, uh, systems. We, we do have a PowerPoint prepped uh, for you and I'll introduce uh, Natalie Weber, the Vice President of uh, Business Development to navigate you through this. And I just wanna thank uh, Howard for allowing us to uh, uh, disinfect their premises and and uh, how are you really show a great uh, leadership uh, 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 trying to keep your uh, employees safe and 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 uh, take care of them so Nally uh, please uh, 
Thanks, Peter. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Peter mentioned, my name is Natalie Weber. I'm the VP of Business Development here at Run Electra Store Group and Sterile Infection Control. I'm going to bring up this PowerPoint real quick. I think you can all see that now. There we go. Okay, so just trying to skip. As we know, Peter is part of the Vaughn Chamber. Um, kind of go through this. Um, again, just a little bit of an overview of how our company funnels off. And I'm just gonna start off quickly here with the video. We'll kind of give you a visual of what we've been doing within the communities. All right, guys, there we go. I got stuck there. Okay, so the product that uh, Peter and I have been using through sterile infection cold is called Sterimest. Uh, the product was originally developed by the US military back in 2001 in response to the 2001 anthrax attacks. It was actually designed to de-weaponize anthrax um, and it was used exclusively by the US military for about 15 years. Um, after that, they have to put it into a more mainstream capacity. Um, from there, it then became a hospital grade medical disinfectant um, and then made its way into infection control, uh, which is how Peter actually discovered the product. We started using it for spore mold remediation purposes prior to COVID. We've been doing this for a while. And then when uh, COVID-19 broke out, it turned out the product we have is extremely effective in fighting the virus. And we've now been using it for those functionalities. The product itself is uh, made up of a 7.8 hydrogen peroxide based solution. Uh, what it does is it goes through an electrical arc where it becomes positively charged, where it's gonna basically kill, terminate, destroy any virus, pathogen, virus, spore, mildew within contact within five seconds. Um, kind of a little bit of overview of more of the features, what kind of sets us aside from any other competitor um, with this type of product on the market. Uh, Foggy machine, we're 100% eco-friendly, EDA, FPA, Health Canada approved. Um, it's totally touchless, so everything we spray is three feet from the surface. Um, it has a high kill rate of a six log kill rate on any type of virus pathogen, like I said. Uh, we're going to leave no odors or residues behind. Uh, that being said, it's safe, so safe to use on any sensitive items. Uh, items such as electronics, uh, silks, fabrics, carpets, anything like that. It's not going to leave any residues, um, staining corrosion, it's safe on metal, metals. Um, we have even use it on respirators, for example. So in the hospital space, it's used on breathing apparatuses. Uh, the product itself is only labeled as an irritant, and that's only if you come in direct contact with it. So if it, while it's being deployed, no one in the vicinity should be worried about that rather than our team of infection control experts. But if it, you did come in contact with it, it's only a little bit of maybe runny eyes, watery, watery eyes, uh, runny nose kind of sort of thing. Um, we can treat up to 10,000 square feet within one hour. So that being said, we're really uh, limiting the time that we're inside the vicinity, uh, minimizing business up interruption. And as soon as we're complete, it's safe to resume business or the home, whatever we're disinfecting immediately after our service. Uh, we have two different application methods. The most popular is a surface unit. Uh, just in the video, like you see in there, it's the handheld unit. Uh, we spray three feet from the surface. 
we can get in and out rather quickly and we can spray all items. Uh, when we go into a um, vicinity, for example, we're going to spray seven feet of wall height always because those are touch surfaces. Um, any type of the desk, the floors, any object that we will see, we will spray. Uh, the environment system acts the same, but is a little bit different. It's uh, really neat. It's a big unit made up of three heads. So we can use them individually as a surface units, or we can use it as one system. Um, I'll go into a little bit in a little bit more in a minute, but for vehicles, for example, ambulances, uh, particularly, uh, we will put the system inside of the ambulance and turn on the system. It will automatically calculate the cubic square footage of the um, area that it's in and it will deploy the product. And once it's 100% pressurized, it's gonna shut off. We allow it to open, air out, and um, it's completely decontaminated. We can use this in larger spaces or smaller spaces, um, but usually when we're doing the larger spaces, we tend to use the surface unit because you're not gonna be burning through so much product by uh, deploying it into the air. So what makes us different than other disinfection um, products and providers and that kind of thing? It's a golden question because um, as Anthony mentioned, same thing what's been happening with us. There's been a lot of pop-up competition. Um, and we really have to, it, it, this, at this point, it's really about education and talking to people and just explaining them the benefits of using technology versus all these pop-up providers that are offering things at astronomically low pricing. Um, first of all, I know we kind of went over that cheat sheet this kind of long. I can actually share this with you guys so I don't take too much of time going over this line per line, um, but we're not gonna cause any corrosion. There's no smells, there's no residues. We're in and out really quickly. Um, because it's a dry fog, there's no cleanup required afterwards. So that being said, there's no manual labor afterwards. So it allows us to get in and out really quickly. Um, as I mentioned before, we can do 10,000 square feet in an hour. Um, you're not gonna find that elsewhere, especially for manually cleaning. The other benefit of our product is gonna get into the nicks and crannies of every little object, um, like your keyboards, for example a lot of sprays are not, no one's going to spray something directly onto your laptop or your keyboard because if any of the fluid gets into the buttons, there's obviously going to be damage, there's going to be corrosion, stuff like that. We are able to do that. It will safely disinfect and get underneath all your little buttons and everything like that without any risk of damage. Again, I can share this all with you, these handouts here. Um, so what makes us different again, I kind of started on that, but all of our technicians are certified in control, infection control professionals. Um, they've all gone through training and they all have their certificates. We've been doing this well beyond before uh, the COVID pandemic. Like I said, we were using this for restoration for spore mold remediation. Um, no, no corrosion, no damages. This product is being used globally in the fight against COVID-19. Um, it's being, it was being used in China. Um, there's being used sprayed on the streets worldwide. Um, mosques um, all around, especially uh, China, Singapore um, is being used for the reopenings over there. Um, we also, um, I kind of touched on this with the ambulance room, uh, we developed a vehicle disinfection center um, over COVID. So it's kind of neat. Essentially what it is, it's like a, a car wash and you drive in, the garage doors closes and we have various heads set up. Uh, one of our technicians can go in and disinfect your vehicle using the fogging system and you can be back on the road again in only seven minutes. So that being said, you drive in, we can have your vehicle sprayed, open, dried, and you're on the road again in only seven minutes. And very fast, effective. Um, for, on the ambulance side of things, it's a success story because I did touch on that. Um, if they had someone with a confirmed case in their ambulance, they would have to throw away all of their supplies that were open in the ambulance afterwards and they would have to go through extensive cleaning and disinfecting before anyone else would be allowed to resume into that ambulance. Um, that being said, they would have to throw open PPE away. So whether it be masks, gloves, any type of supplies. Um, it was about, when I was speaking with them, it was approximately about $2,000 worth of supplies that were thrown away each time that something like this would happen. And it takes about four to five hours for two people to disinfect to their standards um, the, the ambulance. But with our product and using the environment system, um, they don't have to throw any away of the material because everything is left decontaminated and using the environment machine, they could be back on the road again in only 15 minutes versus four and a half hours. Um, like I said, it's also a medical grade disinfectant. It's been built into the surgery rooms. Um, so in, especially it's been used various uh, hospitals actually throughout the States 
they'll build in this environment system into the, their ceilings. Um, so after surgery, they'll shut off the HVAC systems, seal the doors, the fog will deploy and um, calculate again the cubic square footage until everything's pressurized and shut off. Air movers or fancy fan, big fans will turn on to get the air circulating. Once everything is 100% circulated and I don't want to say dry, but everything is disintegrated, the door is open and they can safe to resume surgery, another surgery immediately afterwards without all that extra downtime. Uh, the product we have actually was also um, proven to reprocess N95 masks and, and uh, any type of PPE equipment up to five times. So this is really interesting. So over COVID again, another thing that we were doing to help the communities, um, especially long-term care facilities and local hospitals, uh, we built um, a PPE disinfection unit. Uh, essentially, it was a unit. We put some polymer water uh, walling on the inside, stainless steel shelving, and we could safely disinfect up to 2,000 masks within an hour. So that being said, we're prolonging the life of that equipment. We're stretching the dollar spent. Um, recycling at its finest. But uh, here, here's just a couple images so you can kind of see. So this is uh, some shots from our vehicle disinfection center. Um, we're disinfecting um, a fire truck right there uh, where the writing is. Sorry, you didn't get a clear, clear view there. Over there, you can see the unit that's set up. That's the environment system. And that's one of our technicians there treating a vehicle. Uh, here's our PPE unit. So you can see there, it was just a trailer that we um, reached, uh, we uh, re uh, refurbished, sorry, stumbling on my words there, but uh, just kind of an example there. So like I said, we would put all the equipment in there. Our guys um, would safely collect uh, the equipment from, like we say a hospital, for example, we had bins. They'd pack everything into the bags. We'd bring the bins out in full PPE. Our guys would safely lay everything out on the shelves, close the doors, start the environment system. And, uh, and again, about 15 minutes per load. So we can about, two, about 2,000 masks within an hour. Um, so we are very versatile and our product is being used basically anywhere and everywhere. Anything that you can spray it on, we can spray it on. Uh, we have been working with a number of partners. We've been in another multiple facilities and operations from homes, um, schools, commercial buildings, uh, manufacturing facilities. Um, we're actually the preferred infection control vendor for COVID outbreaks for the city of Mississauga. So whenever there's an outbreak in Mississauga, we're called upon it to treat the location and for also maintenance dis disinfections after the fact. Um, we also have an exclusive partnership with AssessMed. Uh, they're a medical examiner um, nationwide and they're using us in their locations on a weekly basis uh, as part of their heightened protocols to bring down VP levels, viral particle levels within their buildings. Um, we also have a partnership with GFL Green for Life Solutions. So this is one that keeps us really busy, just kind of give you an idea of the, how versatile we actually are. Um, they ha have about 126 to 130 sites around the GTA and outside the GTA. And they're sending our guys, we have guys dedicated to them every day going around site to site. And they have us doing things from disinfecting cranes between crane operators, switching shifts. Um, to going at the end of the day to spray equipment before the guys come in the next day. We're doing sites, we're doing trailers and everything for them. Uh, we've actually done some, I didn't see this listed here, but another neat one. Uh, we've been on a couple movie sets for Netflix. They've been using us on the movie sets because it's safe to use on all their props and everything like that. Because again, no damages or anything um, will be resulted of the use of our product. I know we're holding off any questions right now until the end, but I just kind of wanted to skip over to this. Uh, this is just kind of something I pulled. It, I know it's CDC information, it's American information, but just the points on it actually kind of really captured of what I was trying to speak to before. Um, in order to successfully contract a virus, you need to contract 1,000 viral particles. So our goal is coming in to regularly um, disinfect facilities to bring these viral particle levels down so that they're not at a transmissible rate. And um, yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, <clears throat> well, one thing I'll ask you though is how, once this product is applied, how long do you have to wait until you can use that office space? You can resume immediately after, as long as there's some airflow within the building, like there needs to be some natural air movement. Um, for example, when I was talking about the vehicles, those are done rather quickly because you can leave the windows down, there's some natural air moving through, about seven minutes. Um, if there's no, absolutely no air movement in there at all, it can take a little longer, obviously, because the particles are still going to spiral around. But if we bring in air movers, which are 
basically just big fans, um, a matter of minutes. Okay, and it's safe great. to remove them. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Natalie and Peter. Um, so Perminder, you're up next. Uh, Perminder Sandu uh, from Santa Technologies. And then Perminder, if you can keep it to about 15 minutes, and then that'll leave us with 15 minutes for a broader Q&A. You're, uh, you're muted, actually. There you go. Well, I thought there's a lip reading uh, experiment here. We, we could try. <laughs> thanks, Brian. Hey, uh, thanks very much, Brian. And, and first, I want to thank you and your team for uh, setting this up. And uh, I've learned a lot uh, from the other speakers. So thank you to, to them as well. Um, as Brian has mentioned, uh, we, uh, Santa Technologies, is a strategic partner with the Vaughan Chamber of Commerce, and we've uh, got a, a promotional offer if you guys want to reach out, uh, we're happy to share that uh, with you. Um, what I want to talk about uh, today is a particular solution that we've developed uh, over the last number of months on how to automate health screening as well as contact tracing within the workplace. I think everyone's uh, heard about the importance of contact tracing. Uh, but we've done it uh, in a way that it actually informs decision making and risk management for employers. Uh, so the way we kind of term it is uh, we provide kind of the bookends of prevention and response as part of your uh, COVID strategy. Uh, the prevention part really is around health screening your employees uh, before they come to work. And also our product can be used with customers as well as visitors to the workplace. And then the other bookend of, of how to respond uh, to uh, a potential case of positive uh, COVID or symptoms. And we call that our rapid response uh, contact tracing. So with that intro, I'm going to quickly share my screen. Everyone see it? Yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, as the speakers from uh, before me, from Howard uh, and Anthony to, to Natalie and Peter talked about all the different strategies, uh, really uh, these are the four major category areas that public health and different ministries of health and workers' compensation have talked about, uh, the distancing, PPE, and sanitization. So uh, welcome everyone to, to contact my fellow panelists uh, for all those things. But when it comes to health screening, we've kind of come up with a very novel uh, approach. And, and we focused on this area because as our background for, for Santa Technologies was really around software development and giving employers uh, tools uh, to better manage our business, uh, we developed a soft uh, screening tool. And then we also found that we could do contact tracing, uh, help with PPE management, but also give real-time reporting for capacity management staggered shifts but then also give you a, a compliance data set uh, for record keeping uh, as well. And then um, when you did have someone with symptoms or positive tests, then we can quickly uh, provide a communications platform to make sure that the, tar the communication is targeted to the people that are impacted as opposed to broad uh, communication. And also to give you the tools as opposed to having find, finding out through media reports and, and what else and, and the possible disruptions for and reputation. Uh, so the, the, on the health screening side, really, uh, if you look at all the recommendations from public health, it focuses on symptoms, contact travel, uh, test history, and then we've incorporated the PPE as well. So those are the four basic things that you need to do in terms of what's recommended by public health to screen your employees. Uh, our, our requirements or our uh, solution can be customized based on client requirements and we've done a lot of custom installations for, for our, our different cost, uh, customers. I kind of touch on what uh, Howard uh, 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 talked about too. Our solution uh, is based on dividing your workplace into zones or worker pods as we call them. Um, so, you know, Howard talked a lot about uh, workflow management and, and things like that. So I think he's the right person to, to call uh, with respect to that. But we help uh, clients to kind of divide their work uh, zones, uh, workplaces into zones and limit the contact within those zones. And again, as I said before, we can do both employees and visitors and or customers to any of these uh, zones. And I'll show you how that works when I uh, quickly do the demo of the product. In terms of, of the benefits, uh, right from a, a people first culture, I heard lots of comments uh, from you know fellow small business owners on the call today, uh, but really important to stress that people first, minimizing that uh, workplace transmission risk, risk uh, but then also doing it where you get that rapid response contact tracing. Because at the end of the day, 
uh, as we reopen our businesses as well as our institutions like schools and everything else, uh, we've seen lots of other jurisdictions get that second surge. And then even the complications of upcoming and cold and flu season is gonna be uh, important. Uh, so it's really su uh, super easy to use and I'll show you that in the demo. So what does it look like? Uh, so our solution uh, is a, a browser-based application. So you can use it on any device from uh, smartphones to tablets to laptops to... <coughs> uh, this is uh, what it looks like on uh, a mobile application right there. For the customers and visitor side of it, we've got two capabilities here. One is you can uh, send a, a custom URL link if you're doing a scheduled appointment. So some of our customers in the healthcare industry, like dental, uh, doctor's offices, and physiotherapy clinics, uh, they're using uh, this predominantly. And they're also using this QR code as well. But our restaurant customers, and uh, as we're speaking on Chamber of Commerce, uh, go reach out to our friends at Grazi. Uh, they're using our system right now as well. So for uh, walk-in customers, you can just scan a quick uh, QR code. And as a requirement uh, for the hospitality sector right now, they have to log all customers visiting. And within 10 seconds, they can log uh, the name and contact information for a customer. Uh, I'm not gonna touch on uh, that, that we can get into that if anyone wants some further information. Onboarding typically for small businesses takes uh, an afternoon or a couple of hours for larger enterprise level customers. Uh, uh, the deployment strategy of the zones and notification profiles for employees has taken uh, several days, and then the implementation takes a couple of days for, for testing and everything else. So not very, uh, it's very quick. I'll skip this as well. Um, and just want to put up my contact information. So I'll do the demo right after this, but uh, if anyone wants to reach out, there's my cell phone as well as my uh, uh, email address. Uh, if you want to visit our website, it's gettingbacktowork.com to get some more details. So given the time, I'm going to just quickly jump over to the demo itself. So I'm going to do two things here. One is uh, uh, or quickly go through the health screening itself uh, and then uh, show you a couple of the reports on how we could do rapid response contact tracing. I do want to uh, reiterate the point here. We integrate with the government app. We, are, we provide a very different uh, uh, solution than the government app on contact tracing, which is more of a public health voluntary system. Uh, this is meant for employers and business owners uh, to help manage their workplace transmission list uh, risk. So I'll hit the get started here. So this would come up with your company name, uh, our demo account, so Santa demo account. You hit start, first question. Uh, is, are you working today? Yes. Uh, you only receive this on the days that you are working, but if you decide not to come in on a particular day, that's the only reason why you would uh, hit no. So here we've already set up the Bond Chamber of Commerce office here, and then we've just divided their office into three uh, zones. So if I'm going to have a meeting in the boardroom, but I work on the west side of their office, I would select those. Uh, I kind of work banker's hours like Brian, so 11 a.m. Uh, sorry, Brian, for picking on you to four o'clock, uh, you hit next. Oh, that was, that was very good. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is our, uh, uh, we also have this uh, uh, my class, uh, feature here since you've, I did this yesterday. Uh, it just asked me, has anything have changed you, my last you. one? So I will say yes uh, to show you the full one, but yeah, otherwise we had this one question and then you can uh, bypass the, the survey. So the first question is, have you tested uh, positive? So if I say yes here, just to, to show you what that uh, looks like when you go next, it just asks you for a, a calendar dropdown of when that was. So our recommendation to all uh, employers is make sure that they have a negative test for an employee before they return to the workplace. If, uh, they, if so an employee does hit yes there, two automated emails get generated, one to the employee saying, hey, you've got a COVID risk factor. In this case, you've got a positive test. Please don't come into the office and seek medical advice. And the same uh, email goes to the system administrator uh, to say that so-and-so uh, uh, has a, an alert, so please uh, contact them. Next question is around symptoms, and we have a pull-down uh, list of the symptoms. This is from the Federal Ministry of Health, and that can be customized. And again, if you hit uh, yes to symptoms, those two uh, emails get generated again, one to stay home for the employee, but then also to the system administrator. 
On the contact question, it's uh, have you come into contact with someone that's symptomatic, suspected, or confirmed? Here, if you hit yes, there's a pull down menu. And this is one of the big benefits and, and Eric Burtis was our law firm that helped us out how to help employers manage their risk and exposure, uh, risk exposure to uh, workplace transmission. So the first three are workplace related, uh, that's the personal. And then if that employee has downloaded the voluntary government app, they can indicate that they got a ping on the app or if it's unknown. And really this is information that helps with workers' compensation claims and, and things like that. And what you need to be doing uh, uh, for making sure there's a minimizing transmission risk in the workplace. I'll just hit no. Next question is the travel. Here, if they answer yes, uh, there's a pull down of where they travel to. Obviously different uh, countries have a different risk profile. And if they answer yes, again, those two automated emails, one to the employee, one to the administrator. I'll hit no. On, on the uh, PPE question and how to help you manage your PPE, this is pulling from my personal uh, profile and this is the PPE that's required for my job. Uh, and that can be individualized on a customer or an employee basis. And if you say that you do have the required PPE, everything's fine. If you say no, uh, all that happens is the email goes to you. Uh, it doesn't tell you to not uh, come to work, but it says make sure you have sufficient PPE uh, before you come to work. Uh, so I'll just say yes for now. And then the system administrator would get the same uh, email. Hit next. So now you get this uh, uh, big green uh, check mark with a date and time stamp on it. Uh, this, uh, most of our customers use this for uh, either access control with a security guard or someone that's monitoring uh, uh, employee uh, entrance. And so as long as you can show your, on your phone, uh, the green check mark or uh, through an email, then uh, the, the security uh, process or access control would be allowed in. So that's the health check. Uh, I'm gonna, I am gonna. won't have time to do all the administrative functions in terms of how to manage the software, but I do wanna talk, uh, go to uh, a couple of the reports and meet Brian's uh, timeline here. So on the contact uh, tracing side, uh, this is the most valuable feature that we've got. Uh, so in a situation where perhaps uh, I uh, say, okay, I've got symptoms, or I said, I do uh, have a, a positive test now, you can go to my name here, hit the contact trace button, pick the time uh, period that you'd like to, to go. So typically 14 days uh, is uh, the recommendation or you can go up to 30 days, hit run report. And now this gives me a, a complete history on date, what offices I was in, the zone that I was in those particular offices, and then a list of all the employees and visitors that were there at the same time at the same place uh, as myself. So this can be uh, printed or exported into Excel spreadsheet and given to uh, public health uh, for uh, further uh, investigation. And again, what the benefit of this is now you know exactly who was in the same time and place as I was, as opposed to having to shut down an entire uh, facility operation. Uh, I will just do one more uh, report uh, on the visitor side. Uh, also, so if you want to see how many visitors that you had, just in case you were uh, made aware that uh, a visitor may have tested positive or come down with symptoms, and if they were in one of your facilities, you would be able to, to find out. So we just did a, a demo auction, another Vaughn business with uh, FAF Automotive. So uh, Myron, who's the chief operating officer for Santa, did this, and then you can drill down and say, okay, he uh, completed at this time. This is the time that he was uh, there in the end time. And this is how he answered uh, those questions. So again, both for employees as well as visitors. If anybody, uh, I, like I said, I put my contact information. If anybody would like a deeper dive into it, happy to do that uh, at uh, uh, a later point. So Brian, with that, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing, turn it over to you. Thanks, Parminder, that's great. Uh, I wanted to ask you about restaurants because you referenced them early on. So from the employee perspective, it's, it's quite clear what the interaction would look like on a regular basis. And I thought you made a good point about reducing risk and liability exposure for the business. Like we always saw the value of that. But so if you're a customer at the restaurant, what is your interaction with this? Assuming that there's no positive COVID testing, so you never got an email about it. Yeah, so a good question, Brian. And for, for restaurants, uh, there's several municipalities that are now have said that it's mandatory for all customers to be logged when they come into a restaurant or a bar. So the interaction would be a simple scan of that QR code. 
we give the restaurant owner three options. They can either, have, the simplest option is just to log them. So we would just record the name, uh, first name, last name, and either a phone number and email address for that uh, customer. And then that would, uh, uh, in case of uh, contact tracing requirements, uh, that information could be provided to public health. But we also uh, give them the option if they want the uh, customer to go through the health screening. And it's typically what we advise is to ask one question, all rolled into one. Uh, have you come into contact? Do you have any symptoms or do you have any travel history? And they can just hit uh, yes or no to that one question and they're done. Uh, so we've had uh, situations where restaurants have uh, used either one of those. So Grazi and, and Vaughn, they use just the contact uh, uh, tracing uh, uh, contact information. Thank, thank, okay, that's great, thanks. So I, I do see a couple of questions. We did have one also from Anthony that I received by text. So uh, Anthony, the, the question that we got was um, when you're dealing, I, I, I'm assuming you can answer this, how do manufacturers ensure personal protective equipment is safe and effective? So I think it's really a question about testing, like how they're satisfied that what they're putting out there does what it's, you know, the efficacy, we're asking about the efficacy. So we, um, my, my, when we do procurement or purchasing, our suppliers are reputable suppliers. They're large suppliers who deal with hospitals, uh, home health care facilities, um, retirement homes. And it, it's difficult at our end um, to do all the follow up on all the products. Uh, but we have to trust in these companies that they're purchasing directly from proper manufacturers who either have FDA or Health Canada certifications. Um, so also places like us, we have to make sure we're not buying by, from jobbers or one-offs, guys that are just going overseas and bringing back a container. Uh, you have to do a little bit of research to make sure uh, where the product is coming from. And you have to trust the person like anything else, whether it be the grocery store um, or, you know, your furniture place or your clothing place uh, that it's, it's fair and legitimate products that you're buying, not knockoff or uh, just, just stuff like that. It, it is a difficult thing. At the end of the day, you should always trust the person you're working with. I think it's a good point. And, and that's really, um, with all the segments the Bond Chamber's done, we've always tried to bring on people that there's a trusted relationship with because uh, we do expect people to contact you guys. Um, okay, so let, let's go to the questions in the, in the chat. And if others have questions, please uh, enter them in there and we'll try and get to them. So, so this is a very broad question. Uh, Maria was asking this. I think it's a very fair question. Uh, so we're asking the speakers, has anyone had staff contact COVID-19 or and it was really about what key learnings were experienced. I believe none of you have. So I guess the question really is, have you heard of any businesses that have had staff contact COVID-19 and, and what are the key learnings there? Anyone uh, want to take that? Yeah. Brian, can I, uh, I, and I respond to that on the chat as well. We've had a few clients now that have had positive test cases and many clients that have had symptomatic on the positive test uh, traces, uh, I'll tell you, it, it, for some of them in the early phases, and we had a large manufacturer, chemical manufacturer that uh, had the situation, and you know, pardon me for being very blunt, uh, frankly, the exact words that they used for, with us uh, when we, before we deployed was, it was a shit show. They, they didn't have a plan in place on, on how to respond to it. Uh, and then from that, they first started to put in a paper-based uh, solution of, of doing screening and, and, and the whole contact tracing. But the exponential growth on the contact tracing, it, it can get very uh, uh, unyielding fairly quickly because then they had to go through all of their employees and then who else they had contact with in their personal lives and, and everything else. Uh, so once we demonstrated our solution of, you know, uh, how quickly you could figure out what other employees and visitors were there, uh, that was very, very uh, helpful for them. But they had to basically shut down uh, their facility, uh, f bring in a full sanitization team. I'm not sure if they brought in Peter or Natalie, but they did have to bring in somebody uh, to do all that. Uh, but it was a, a service disruption for about three or four days before they got everything back uh, going. And they were an essential service, so they were open. Howard, did I, did you want to add something? Uh, we had one of our sales reps um, 
uh, come down with COVID through his wife. Um, we were fortunate that he was off at that time, hadn't been in our facility. Um, so our facility remained, and it was before Peter sanitized it, but our, our facility remained open, but he was nowhere near our building and nowhere near clients. One of his, he happens to, to work in the educational field and all the schools were closed anyway. So it didn't affect us, but it was quite, uh, it was uh, eye-opening. You're muted. Sorry, right? I, I muted myself. Yeah, Anthony, you're up. Yeah, you, you want to add something? Yeah, so we, we um, I, I don't know if we were considered or we are considered frontline workers, but, you know, we, a, a lot of the places we deliver to are retirement homes, old age homes, and some of the homes that we had to visit uh, were on total lockdown. Some of the hospitals we, we visited were on total lockdown. But with their social responsibility towards COVID and our responsibility, it gelled together very nicely. The fact that, you know, they wouldn't let us in the building, um, maybe to deliver a hospital bed or to deliver some products. We had to deliver at the front door, sanitize right in front of them, and then they would take it. And the onus kind of went on to the homes and the hospitals where their maintenance crews had to now deliver the product to um, the specific client. Uh, we were around it right from day one. Uh, and, and the amount of plastic that we had to wear and still wear when we're going into a home, masks, gloves, goggles, aprons, booties, you know, uh, Jenny Craig has nothing on. You want to lose a couple pounds, you put that much plastic on and, and, and try to deliver a bed. You're, you're losing weight. But uh, back to the social responsibility of everybody trying to keep each other safe, the distancing. Um, we, again, we came into contact with it every day. Uh, and uh, to a certain degree, not one of my employees or I, you know, knock on wood, came down with it. Uh, very fortunate. And I, and I think it, again, is because of the social responsibility that everybody has taken over the last six months. Great, thank you. Um, well, I actually, I had a question for Permender that came in uh, by text. Uh, can your uh, health screening be used by airlines? Actually, that came in from two different people. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and we've talked to all the major airlines uh, uh, in Canada, and we've had some, uh, and we're still having some ongoing uh, conversation uh, with them, and broadly the, the tourism sector uh, as well. Uh, right now, uh, Air Canada is doing um, screening uh, themselves. Uh, uh, right at check-in. Uh, so both when you uh, remotely check in as well as when you uh, check in at a kiosk uh, at, at the airport. Uh, and so we're still in some ongoing discussions because they don't have the same reporting back end that we've been able to produce, but they have been, they have developed an in-house uh, uh, solution at, uh, within, Air Air, within Air Canada through their reservation system and check-in system. Okay. Uh, okay, I want to go to Joe's question. There's a lot there, so I'm just going to read it as it is, and we'll try and break it down. Um, and, uh, okay, given all speakers have employees, what policies and practices are being put in place as we move into the normal cold and flu season? In the past, employees came into work with cold and flu symptoms, and no action was really taken. Given COVID, given COVID will employees be forced to stay home, and if so, how would you handle this from a work perspective, salary and return to work? Uh, so really what we're talking about here, I, I think, is, and Joe, you can, you can add in, but it's that I think we're going to see a lot of people getting normal flus in cold and flu season. They're not going to have COVID. They might, but yeah. they probably don't based on statistics. But ultimately, this is going to scare a lot of workplaces. Uh, what actions do you expect those workplaces to need, are, are going to need to take? Yeah, and just to add to that, so uh, depending on the nature of the business, some employees uh, uh, don't have benefit plans. So, you know, if they're asked to stay at home, generally it's going to be like, you know, a personal unpaid leave or something like that. So how, how are each of you planning on handling that, given that you all have employees and, you know, we are going into cold and flu season and some of the some of the symptoms uh, for cold and flu overlap with COVID. So 
yes, Brian, you're right. I mean, you, you know, the, the odds are still probably, you know, uh, against it being COVID, but you still want to protect your business, your employees, and your clients. So how are each of you going to handle that? Uh, I see Anthony's got his hand up. So I, I add one more protection to that, Joe, is my family and your family and everybody else's family. Right. Um, we're, we're a little bit different where we have a small staff. And like I said, we, we, we're interacting with more with the possibility of having COVID. So my staff and I, we sat down and we spoke about it right at the beginning. Um, we're, we're four to five people uh, on staff, including myself. One is a retired police officer, which he has decided not to work since March, and I was totally up to him. I gave him the, the total, um, almost respect for staying, I'm staying home now. Now with the, the rest of us, we've decided that we do get, uh, if there's any symptoms, cough or sneezing, that's persistent. You know, allergy season came along and you're standing in line at the liquor store and the guy behind you sneezes, is it the pollen or is it COVID? Um, so, but what we did is when we sat down, we've decided uh, that if the symptoms, if there's any type of symptoms that show, the first thing you do is get to a facility and get tested. You know, you can take a day or two off until those tests come back. Uh, fortunately, I am going to continue to pay my guys uh, while they're off. Um, I, I'm in that position right now. Uh, but it, I also understand that they have families at home. So the, at any given point, we have also said to each other that the minute you feel unsafe, you stop coming to work. Because I don't want to put your family at risk. And, and we are in contact with a lot of people. Um, and the other thing that we've kind of done is we've ensured, you know, the government mentioned a bubble. Please stay within a bubble of people. We have included ourselves within that bubble. And we've kind of said, um, please don't go to barbecues with more than 10 people. Please don't go uh, to the distillery district and have dinner. Uh, try to be responsible to us as we're being responsible to you and be responsible to our clients that we're trying to help. That's great, and, and kudos to you to, to, to sort of, uh, you know, uh, preparing that before it actually gets to that point and, you know, uh, entertaining, you know, continuing to pay your employees because that's going to be a huge challenge with a lot of businesses that are already struggling now, you know, with cash flow and things like that. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I you know I'm just a cognizant of time, but I want to let the others answer. Natalie, Peter, did you want to answer? Just, I don't want to so, give you the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, what we're doing, based on the fact that we're a disinfection sterilization company, uh, we're making sure like our guys are starting at six o'clock in the morning every day. So we do have uh, a thermometer, a gun uh, that they're taking uh, uh, each other temperature every single day. Uh, we're disinfecting our offices uh, twice a week. So we're actually working in an environment that if we can... Uh, uh, make sure we're not catching COVID or got to make sure we're not catching any other viruses or, or flus because we're kind of all the time working in a sterile environment, right? So uh, we're taking any precaution that uh, we, we can't even afford to, to have our technicians uh, being sick because we got to help somebody else, right? So we, we got to make sure and, and uh, uh, for the past six months, uh, I got to tell you, I don't know what it is, probably is the product, but none of our technicians got sick and they didn't even are allowed to take uh, uh, days off. Uh, but if it's happening, of course, we're going to take care of them. They're going to stay home until they're getting better. Uh, and uh, uh, talk about benefits, we had to cancel our benefits because of the the situation, the financial situation every business is in because we do have other two divisions, construction and uh, restoration, which are, which are not doing great. Uh, but yes, this is what uh, we're doing. We're making sure that uh, we're doing everything we can so they're not getting sick during the time they're at work. Hey Brian, can I just add a couple yeah, of comments? Yeah, yeah, for sure, Brian. 
Uh, Joe, that's, that's a very, very important and critical um, question. And uh, what I'll say is that in developing our product, uh, one of our biggest expenses actually has been our uh, lawyers. And we really went into the employment legislation part of this in, in a lot of depth uh, too. Uh, and I'll talk about that. And the other thing is, um, I want to make sure I mention is we've done presentations both for the federal uh, treasury board as well as the Ministry of Finance. Uh, I think we will see some sort of, uh, there's been an announcement on it at the federal government already around sick days and how they're going to do that. Uh, so we've had some of those meetings too. So it's going to be the record keeping side of, you know, the interaction between cold and flu season and COVID is going to be important because there might be a federal uh, program around within the stimulus and recovery side of things. So it's important that you keep some uh, records there. But fundamentally, your question is one of around risk management, and what ought an employer do and what's the obligations. And when we talk to our lawyers uh, about this, the law in Canada is actually quite vague in this. We haven't had a pandemic in recent uh, history or, or, and there's not much case law uh, around it. But they've really uh, stressed the importance of the obligations of the employer to have that safe work environment and take a precautionary approach. And I'll just mention one other uh, thing on this. If you've been watching the, the US uh, news, the Senate in the US is actually trying to legislate that there is no obligation for workplace transmission for employers. I don't think that'll ever happen in Canada, but you have to be careful there. And I want to touch on one other thing, uh, I think that Peter mentioned around temperature. The other things that we're doing with our solution is actually integrating uh, um, IoT devices for temperature, oxygen levels, and even now they're saying that uh, science or the mo latest research is around uh, the loss of smell and taste are the better indicators of potential COVID. And so we're trying to see if we can integrate that into it uh, as well. But that risk management uh, part is critical. And our most of our clients do have some policy that says, hey, any symptoms that are similar to COVID, take the precautionary principle. Uh, I went and got my COVID test on Saturday and I got the results by Monday afternoon. So uh, I think someone mentioned, you know, stay home for a couple of days. Thanks, Perminder. Uh, I know it's almost 11.30, so I'm gonna just uh, give that question to Howard. And, and Howard, at the same time, I'm gonna ask you one question that uh, was on my mind during your presentation. So you get an extra question because you sponsored the segment, which is just about, it's a conversation you and I had not long ago. How do you, if you're not a restaurant, Okay, let's take out certain retailers and restaurants out of the equation. So if you're a business office, how do you balance redesigning your space for COVID with your longer term planning for what your vision for your office is in two, three, five years? Sure. So I'll skip the first question because uh, I think everybody answered that. Um, all right. So when we walk into new spaces, the, the first thing we, we we get is, well, we're managing very well because our employees are from home and, and so far it's been great. Okay, so A, why are you looking at new space? That's the first question. Most of the people, entrepreneurs and owners are saying, well, you know, I'm building a space, I'm building a business, but I don't know what it's gonna look like. Okay, so when you're building a business, you're hiring people. How are you going to onboard new staff while you're, everybody's working from home? How are you gonna train the staff? Are you gonna give them a laptop and have them sit in their basement? How do you develop corporate culture? Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, I've built uh, my building here on, on Credit Stone. Um, you know, we've got 50 staff. Could I move home? Um, you know, possibly with a few staff in the basement and probably make the same amount of income. Yeah, but that's not the entrepreneurial spirit. So are we going to be in this position for the rest of my career? I doubt it. I don't think it's healthy for staff to be working from home. I think you're going to start to see, uh, and it might change when kids go back to school, but um, it's a, it's a question that's up in the air, but you know, uh, uh, Brian, it, we've had this discussion and, and you're right. What am I building this business for? So um, unlike uh, some of the mayor's comments on our AGM, which, which I was a little frustrated with, you have all these big businesses in Vaughan and all these companies in Vaughan all the way from, you know, the people on my street that have built uh, empires 
and own all the buildings on Credit Stone that have been big contributors to the new hospital, down to the people that are the dry cleaning, convenience stores, lunch places. They're all relying on business getting back to work. So we'll see what happens over the next little while. Right now, it's about bringing our staff back safe, healthy, um, keeping the work environment healthy, and hopefully growing our businesses. And I guess that's what the Vaughn Chamber is all about. That is what the Vaughn Chamber is all about. Um, okay, I wanted to uh, thank you all. Uh, those were really great presentations. We, we actually got a lot of feedback uh, through private chat and text messages. This will be available um, on the Vaughn Chamber website and I believe on our YouTube channel, right, Jen? But uh, yeah, Jen says yes. Um, coming up, uh, well, and I'll just close this though. I, I, I think there was a lot of value here and I hope that um, uh, everybody understands. It's never about saying these are the companies you need to work with. We'd be happy if you did, but it's about saying like, how to position your workplace to keep your employees and your customers and yourself safe. And as some of you mentioned, and your family safe. So I thought there was a, a really a lot of value here and I wanna thank you all again. Um, going forward, uh, the Vaughn Chamber has a golf day coming up. Uh, it won't be a golf tournament, but it will be a golf day and we'll be able to social distance and we'll be outside. That's September 24th at the Country Club. And there's going to be more networking events uh, in September. Uh, we're just we're waiting to get through August, uh, so we'll go back to some of our networking events. I see Enzo's on here. I think you've been on every single networking session we did, so we'll look for you there. And I uh, just want to wish you all a great uh, rest of the day. And uh, if you need us or any of the companies that are on here, you can watch this again or just contact the Vaughn Chamber at info at vaughnchamber.ca, and uh, we'll pass along contact information for the uh, speakers. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brian.